Yeah, go ahead. The preview of the talk that we're going to have on uh, April 23rd in Seattle. The discussion is how can we trust recommendations or decisions made by a machine? And uh, how can we use machine learning and deep learning to detect the degree of falsity or misinformation across 35 indicators? Um, we, we live in an era where social media and uh, publishing is something that can easily propagate good information. So, but it can also essentially help us with uh, understanding uh, the fakeness and amount of information content in actual corpus or news content or documents. One of the motivating examples that we have is uh, in terms of how do we trust uh, the recommendations or the decisions made by uh, an algorithm or set of algorithms, an ensemble of an algorithm, where we can gain trust uh, and begin to rely or at least rely for input into decision making on the machine's work. One of the first counter examples is the area of adversarial attacks that exists. For example, uh, in 2017, um, Papineau, Mc, uh, McDaniel, and Ian Goodfellow, who are well-known um, researchers in this area, published practical black box attacks against machine learning and showed how it's very possible to, in the context of a very simple autonomous vehicle, to uh, cause the autonomous vehicle not to stop at a stop sign uh, by creating an adversarial attack on that image so that the stop sign with a slight perturbation, uh, which is called actually a mosquito net, and I'll show you why in a second, is interpreted not as a stop sign, but as a turn to the right or a yield sign. And this allows us to, for example, mistake a recommendation or a classification in this case of a panda, initially with 57 and seven confidence, introduction of that mosquito net adversarial attack it would be a high confidence given, which is a completely incorrect. Or for example, misdetect actors, which are well-known figures, uh, in this case, uh, adding an adversarial noise, undetectable by the human eye to the image, causing the uh, classification to be of a different type of person. In these examples, uh, we also have areas where uh, it's not only misinformation or misclassification, it's also uh, the focus or the segment of focus, instead of being on the tripods or king penguins here, is focused on, for example, the classification as a tripod where the primary uh, subjects in this photo, the segments of the photo, are actually king penguins. So this shows that there are there's the possibility of adversely attacking and manipulating the results of uh, even deep neural networks uh, and with very little insight into what goes on in the black box. So we will be talking about that and uh, we will be talking about how to build trust in your AI system, what are some best practices, how to build fairness, transparency and accessibility. Uh, and we will be talking about a project started at the San Jose State University called Project Alternus Vera, which aims to detect the amount of misinformation in a document using 35 factors. And um, we will also be looking at the notion of interpretability, uh, going from black box AI, uninterpretable, to having increased transparency, increased explainability, and justifiability. Uh, imagine in a court or legal or litigation scenario, or justification for denying or accepting a certain insurance claim or a certain mortgage decision or loan decision, and then making sure that this is a repeatable process, that it's not done correctly once, but that the pipeline of information that's coming in is actually a reliable um, machine learning pipeline that can provide re repeatable points of 
um, fairness, transparency, and accessibility. So one of the things we can do, which we'll go into much more detail in the talk, is how can we minimize the impact of false information? First of all, by detecting it, stopping it from spreading, or, which is not you know, anything that can be done uh, less than legislation. For example, the government of Singapore is providing legislation since last year as a 22 article proposition to limit legislation, uh, limit uh, the propagation of what may be considered to be false information by social media, which we'll explore, or by providing information to the possible recipients of the existence, the degree of falsehood, and uh, the intent, uh, malicious intents uh, of certain uh, corpuses of information. What helps in this regard is to develop a score called the Alternosphera score, which is really not just one single number, but a tensor uh, of numbers, which will help us in assessing uh, the degree of uh, truth or falsehood in a document. Um, and we're gonna explore how every semantic or syntactic inflection that we have adds a piece of information. Like for example, if we're in a video situation, we can choose the tone, selection of words, the gestures, facial expressions, micro expressions, each adds some information that can be interpreted and value can be extracted from it. Uh, this pertains to the issues we have in extracting and transforming unstructured data into structured data. Uh, by analyzing intent, topics, sentiment, and summarization of the content. Uh, the same day in the afternoon, I'll be holding a natural language processing and generation workshop. It'll be a hands-on workshop. Uh, well, I'll show you through Python code and a Jupyter notebook uh, how to look at machine learning approaches and deep learning approaches uh, to do applied NLP and NLG, natural language processing and generation. The topics I'm gonna to be covering are going to be uh, pre-processing of the information, including lower casing, stemming, lemmatization, tokenization, cleansing and forming dictionaries, embedding of models like bag of words, TFIDF, what the concept of distillation means in terms of topic modeling, sentiment, ranking, and further aspects of distillation. We're gonna then be exploring word embeddings, such as Google's word to vec and exploring semantics in terms of proximity, uh, word meanings as a vector. We're going to explore two additional elements, which are doc to vec and LDA to vec. I have a chat. Uh, do you use the tensor and collapse into a fitness function? How do you optimize and determine determination? Um, I can broadly uh, talk about, yes, uh, we do collapse it into a fitness function. Uh, and the termination criteria is essentially based upon the determination of each one of the individual factors. And the, we use an attention score uh, against each of, the fit, each of the fitness factors, the 35 fitness factors, which essentially provides us with uh, a weighting, which is a hyperparameter. And then we collapse that into a fitness function for that specific uh, score that we provide as a tensor. Um, we're gonna be looking at doc to vec and LDA to vec, which are additional word embeddings that are there. And then we're gonna look at deep learning approaches uh, using various forms of long short-term memory or LSTMs, which are traditionally used in NLP, specifically by LSTMs or bi-directional LSTMs used as an autoencoder, and then having an attention layer and having uh, a layer which is a decoding layer, which provides us with, for example, a prediction of the next. We're gonna explore the role of uh, recurrent neural networks, uh, which is part of the LSTM, but other types of recurrent neural network variations. And we're also gonna explore reinforcement learning and what are some of the best practices when we're approaching uh, the preparation of data for deep learning specifically in terms of sparsity, regulate, regularization, normalization, and holdout. So I look forward to sharing and collaborating with all of you on this information and uh, hope to see you in Seattle. Is guess 
class specific uh, anchoring proposal for 3d object detection so the idea behind that so now there's a lot of object detection in 3d uh, lidar and rgb images so there's one famous work done by ko and they propose an aggregated view object detection called avid model for 3d object detection on kitty data set which is a one of the benchmark data set in 3d object detections so in my presentations i will extend uh, the i will talk about the extension of that method which we, which we call cap at it avid cap mean class specific anchoring proposal technique so we extend the avid framework by adding a class specific anchoring proposal to improve the anchoring strategy for addressing the issue of classes which have object with large variations in size and aspect ratio so we know that there's a lot of development nowadays uh, in uh, vision so one is development is lidar which is light detection and ranging technology and so after lidar uh, came so there's a lot of uh, object detection in lidar data which is one of the uh, ongoing research and uh, application in auto self driving car so in lidar so the basically the predictive models have been developed to estimate 3d bonding box using point cloud produced by lidar sensor because the point cloud is an unstructured collection of points in 3d space it is difficult to apply standard convolution operation <clears throat> so what we are doing in this so we basically transforming the 3d uh, to 3d point cloud sensor data into a 3d voxel grid space and then we also compute a bold eye view images from them and then we can combine the bold eye view with the traditional rgb images and we can propose anchors and then we can find objects in combining and um, both type of images so in my present in my talk so i will discuss what are the problems in the existing technique that are used so they all are using the same type of anchoring for all type of classes so if you see there is a lot of variations in object sizes and object aspect ratio so the problem is that then one way solution is to address this problem we need to generate a large number of anchors with various sizes and aspect ratio but that take a computationally very long time so the other solution is we can uh, uh, we can model and uh, the classes with some uh, clustering of the sizes of those objects so i tried k mean clustering and expected session maximization based technique to cluster the object in those uh, uh, data sets and then based on that i <laughs> proposed the anchors using those cluster techniques and then it improve the recall in 3d object detection model so this is the framework that i will present in detail during my presentations in this framework there is first we have rgb one sensor and the other one is the lidar from lidar we compute the bold eye view input and then we apply the encoder to encoder framework encoder decoder framework the idea behind encoder decoder framework is to take those images and pre process with convolutions and then compute a feature map from those two types the idea behind the bottom up framework is to compute the features that enables local as well as global information of these images after those so the next step is when we have the feature maps then we apply the class specific big anchoring techniques on both feature maps and then we 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 regress uh, those anchors and then we apply the second network which is a regional proposal network and the idea of regional proposal network the anchor that we generate initially using the feature map and we find the region of interest that have maximum uh, uh, possibility of the object and we take those uh, region of interest and we put in the third model which is the final detection and pose estimation and at the end we get the 3d bonding box for the object as well as the orientation and pose estimation so the idea behind is if we take one cluster and this is the histogram of the object that overlap in <coughs> in with ground truth and if you see so we have very few objects that 100% overlap but there are a lot of objects that are less than 50% or 60% overlap for the cyclist class as well as pedestrian class so if you increase the anchors 
you see we have more now overlapping with the ground truth. If you further increase the cluster, then we have more. Dr. Uh, Dr. Humayun Ashit, we are seeing your title slide still. You probably have to move. Oh, on maybe. I believe we're seeing on, on Zoom, we're seeing the presentation mode, the presenters, not the actual uh, okay. detail that you're seeing. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. We're seeing the title slide. You okay, let me do again. Okay. Can you see now? Yeah, now we can see. Ah, good. Thank okay. you. So, yeah, so I was quickly going through the slides again in a short time. So, okay. So, so th these are the uh, RGB and LiDAR images. And then this is the problem that we are talking about the uh, proposing all the ankle reduction sizes and then we're applying with K-mean clustering. So this is a framework that we uh, I will talk during my presentations. There are three networks. One is encoder-decoder network that produce the feature maps. Then we have class-specific anchoring that produce the anchors. Then we use the region proposal network that uh, find region of interest that are further input to the third network, which is the final detection and pose estimation. And then we have get the detected objects in 3D. <clears throat> so the idea behind that when we use the anchors, so here's the histogram of the overlapping of the anchors and the ground truth. You see here, there's less than 1% or close to uh, the 100% overlap. Very few objects that are 100% overlap. Then if you increase the anchors, we have more objects that are mostly overlapping with the ground truth. With four and even with five, when we have more overlapping uh, of the ground truth with the anchor proposals. So I will talk more about how we use these uh, class specific based anchoring techniques and compare with other framework, the average, simple average, which have one uh, generic way of anchoring. And then there are two other methods, voxel net and F point net, which also use one uh, way of anchoring for all the type of the anchors. So we got higher accuracy specifically for the pedestrian and the cyclist and the car as even though, so we more than 10% to five, uh, five to 10% increase in accuracy in between those easy, hard cases. So the, the, on the left side, there's result from the average method where there's a lot of missing, especially for cyclist and the pedestrian. And in the uh, cap average, we are mostly detecting those objects. So even, even though they are still, still missing some objects, but it's better as compared to simple average technique. Yeah, these are the points that we discussed in my presentation. So hopefully see you all. Oh, dear. Learning in the enterprise from a cloud setting. Um, and this is for real time uh, and experiences. It's been a two year journey that we've built uh, at Sony PlayStation. And Sony PlayStation, uh, as you may know, but uh, just as a reminder, we're pushing the boundaries of play. Uh, so we are at the edge of what it takes to, to play. And in, the environment is fairly sophisticated and requires very low latency behaviors, like under 200 milliseconds. We've grown tremendously. Uh, even these numbers are, uh, it's hard to keep up to them. We're at the 100 million level now. And that is a lot of uh, data, a lot of opportunity. And that opportunity is uh, also driven by the growth of the platform. Not only uh, in our ecosystem is there a, where you can uh, buy and play and look at videos, but there's also the social aspect. Now gaming is an incredibly social aspect. I'm sharing this more to give you context of how we've implemented, but I believe it's a really broad setting that it can apply to many enterprises. And um, even more specifically, I'll give you a use case because it's really good to have a concrete example of how to deliver enterprise machine learning on the cloud. And this one's on uh, personalizations and recommendations uh, about games based on the user profile and their friends, all their social signals. So imagine that this person shows up and we know a few things about them. That's the cloud of information surrounding this person. We also have some contextual information. So this gives us the, the most real time, most immediate information about uh, what day it is, what time it is, what um, console they're on, what device. And we need to make these predictions. And they look like this. For the many games that we have, we have 10,000 of games and more. Uh, give them a score of the most relevant for this individual user. So those are the scores. That's, those are predicted. That involves 
uh, neural networks or regression trees or whatever you can do to maximize the likelihood that you're right and you can increase engagement. Now, if you change something like it's uh, now no longer at night, it's the morning, uh, the prediction should be different because uh, different situations of day are important. Now, if a totally different person shows up, now uh, clearly those should reflect the behaviors of what that person would like. So how to deliver those scores, how to deliver those scores also when um, the, the, the consumer demands privacy, how to uh, configure your database so that uh, this flag can be turned on and now all we have to go on is maybe the most popular titles for that day. So to do this, we have created a platform, a scoring platform for relevance. I'll let you quickly read that. It's a, it's a system that we've developed in-house, running on the cloud, but it's a service that, people, that all our components within PlayStation can call to say, okay, what's the most relevant item for this person? And Oh, Gabber, people are asking to increase your slide size. They're not able to see. How about that? Oh, ah, yeah, no, no, okay. On top of the scoring platform, we have some other components that sort of the meat of the subject. How to summarize all this information and how, how to do the machine learning uh, on the cloud. And beyond those components, there's even more, uh, but there's only so much time I can, I can talk to, so I'll focus on the ones that I showed. And to start with is DataOcean. So we want to enable engineers to have access to all the information available in the organization, but it's still supporting privacy asks. And some of the challenges are uh, how to do this, how to secure personal identifiable information, so I'll mention some of these challenges that happen at the enterprise level. We are on AWS, and so I'll mention a few of the components there, such as the use of S3 to uh, store this data and the Parquet files to be able to quickly uh, select some subsets of the data, such that we can drive both production uh, predictions, but also at the enterprise reporting, the one place to store all the data incredibly important for enterprise data-driven methods. Next comes the machine learning platform. This allows uh, machine learning engineers to deploy models. Um, this is a new field. There's very few solutions out there that can do this because only now is, the, is it valuable to do it on experiences. There's plenty of challenges here. How to codify, how to deploy, how to serve predictions for online features, uh, if you have a machine learning background, you'll know that, how to, that it's critical to have the, the data to be properly put into, otherwise it's garbage in, garbage out. This solution in, includes some of the many components that you'll recognize from AWS anyway, such as uh, the SageMaker and EMR and Lambdas and S3s. We also wrap it up into our own uh, in, infrastructure with the use of GitHub and Jenkins, Kafka. Those are some of the details we'll go into. Now, finally, that we have some machine learning componentry to work with, we need to aggregate the information about the customers and the items that are going to be recommended. How to deliver this service? This is, these are the features that the machine learning models of production are going to use. This needs to be a very fast service with under 20 millisecond access to the information large data, so we'll go into how to store this in um, solutions like Aerospike and how to, how to do the solutioning in S3. So, we need to store all these kinds of information about both the user, the customer, and the items. But then, with all that information, we can finally do the machine learning, the, the scoring, such that we apply within under 50 milliseconds the uh, neural network or the regression tree. And uh, this needs to be enterprise-wide. It needs to do it accurately, quickly, cost-effectively. 
and we'll show you some of the mechanisms we use to keep the costs down and the performance up. Um, we need to do the for all those items that needs to be freshly scored, how to do that in a, for such a large number of items and such a large number of users. We need to quickly rescore if the user just bought some game, we know that that's going to impact the new, next wave of predictions. We shouldn't be recommending more games. They're likely have already spent the, their $70 that they want to now enjoy. There are some technical uh, challenges of, of doing the relevant scoring and uh, algorithmic ones. So I'll go into these, how, what to do with highly skewed data, what to do with uh, recurring kinds of items or short-lived items or items that appear every minute, uh, along with those that have complex engagement, easiest way to understand the complex is social. A friends of a friend of a friend enjoy, enjoyed this game. How does that signal get involved? You'll recognize some of the um, common challenges here, such as the, the long tail of, of items and customers. And we'll talk briefly about things like collaborative filtering and content-based content methods, and how to implement them in the cloud. One of the last things I cover is, and it's not only about the machinery, but in enterprise, you need to uh, get everyone uh, upgraded, upskilled. We continue to run a machine learning um, university at SAE that we've created ourselves, and all our engineers, ML engineers, have gone through it, and we now have discovered the latent talent that already existed in the organization to, to deliver all this that I've just shown. And that is um, my summary, again, much more to say on this, but I, I hope you had a good taste for uh, the content. I believe that uh, this is good. Go ahead. Oh, perfect. So thank you very much, Dr. Murthy. Uh, my name is Soma Padacharya, and I manage the data science team for Expedia Group's customer operations team uh, within its e-commerce platform. Um, I'm sure most of you are familiar with Expedia Group, but we are the world's largest travel platform. And here in our customer operations group, what we do is build efficient and intelligent solutions for our customers. Um, with that, I will, I'm also a hands-on data scientist with a background in causal inference model building. And as the title can say, it's one of my favorite things to talk about. So my talk is not going to be about a particular domain within AI but it's meant to tease your brains about how to approach AI in general, right? So with that, let's get started. So what you see here is normalized search activity for the term Expedia in Google. And so that's, that's the, what the orange line is for, and there's a blue line, right? Um, I know this is a webinar, so we can't interact here, but what do you think the blue thing could be? And this is for a time period of 12 years. The blue line, as you can see, seems to go hand in hand. Calories burned, correct? A typical machine learning model, I mean, this is, of course, a ludicrous example. A typical machine learning model would pick this as a predictor. But we all know, going back to our stats class, they tell you that correlation is not causation. So, but what is causation is not very easily understood. And with that, I'd like to talk about what is causality. So causality is the relationship between an effect and the cause that gave rise to it. Uh, humans often only know intuitively. I'm hearing an echo. Hello? Yes, go ahead, please. I'm hearing an echo at my end. I don't hear one at mine. Oh, okay, perfect. <laughs> Just wanted to make sure. Um, so as humans, you know, we know intuitively about cause and effect, right? Say, for example, you know, you walked outside, you saw a wet street and you knew that it just rained a little while ago, you would know that, you know, yes, 
the rain probably caused a wet street. And causality or causal thinking is one of the things that actually distinguishes our human species from all other living species on Earth. I mean, this spans centuries of thought, right? Aristotle, when he said, to know is to know the final cause. Hume, Pearl, J.D. Pearl, who is the modern father of ca causality, they've all been saying the same thing, that you know, causality is something that data cannot easily identify. And so, um, just going back to the examples, like in businesses, when we want to grow, we do marketing. We pay various online tech firms, we do digital marketing, SEMs, we ditch bid for digital marketing, uh, probably to Google, Facebook. And, but then how do you really know if your millions and billions were really responsible for the increased sales? So that is what causality is all about. There are three independent dimensions to causal reasoning. One is the explanation or prediction. Uh, the other one is factual and counterfactual. And the third thing is observation or manipulation. Um, we'll go over an example just to see how this might work. So say the weather is summer and there's an ice cream parlor. What do they observe? They observe more ice cream sales and higher electricity bills. Now, does that mean that higher electricity bills are a result of more ice cream sales? Or are more ice cream sales causing higher electricity bills? And the answer is definitely not, because the true causal factor for higher electricity bills and for higher ice cream sales is really the weather here. And so a causal analysis aims to identify factors that are independent of spurious correlation. So if we had thought that ice cream sales or electricity bills were connected to each other, then that would have been a spurious correlation and wouldn't have allowed us to make well-informed decisions. And connecting that to the current state of AI. So, we see a lot of AI-based models right now, and most of them are basically machine learning tasks, which are either descriptive, like the recommender systems that you can observe. Um, you know, they observe certain human behavior or customer behavior, and then make suggestions based on that. Or we have predictive kind of machine learning models out there, right? Chatbots. They predict intents from unstructured text and convert that to action. But what they're essentially doing is predicting. They're not answering why, the question of why, which is, all, which is what causality is all about. So why do we need to incorporate causal revolution in AI? Because causality is just about everywhere. So ML models based on correlation can be biased and misleading. And we've seen examples of recent failures of even large technological companies failing to identify the root cause. Why? Because most of those ML models were based on a certain kind of methodology. Um, in my detailed talk, I will go over the details of how a causal model or causal inference engine is really structured and how one needs to think about um, modeling or like inferencing from the data that they have um, if they were to truly um, extract the causality. And solving for the whys, the hows and the what ifs is definitely going to be more efficient than the current ML approaches. Um, which will translate to savings for the businesses. So let us actually go into the formal model of defining causality or what a causal model should look like, right? So what you see here is the simplest form of model in the top row, um, which we called association or Perl defines as association. Now these are your typical ML models. Um, which is probability of y given a set of x features, right? Um, what would y be if, you know, based on the features that I observe in my data? Examples, what does a survey tell us about election results? 
um, what symptoms tell me about a disease. Um, we build models all the time, you know, um, even on the marketing side of things, uh, trying to understand if, um, if, um, if, if, if we spent on a certain marketing uh, channel uh, and we saw some changes, we, we start predicting based on those features um, and so on and so forth, right? But what that really is missing is it does not go down deep into answering the question of why that X was really causing Y to change. And that's why a typical ML model, um, when you're setting up a lot of models, you would see there would be multiple sets of X satisfying that Y. And unless you're able to pinpoint which one of those X's was truly causing or having an impact on Y, that kind of a modeling approach is not going to be able to give you an efficient solution. Uh, interventionist models, right? We have started doing in AI space a little bit, we've had some progress um, talking about these kinds of questions, right? And the interventionist models are more like, what if instead of this, I did this? So if particular features, X naught, say, you know, that's your set of features, is changed to X prime, what would be the value of Y? And some of that would be like models that you have, like reinforcement learning, uh, we do experiments, contextual bandits, those fall into that category. But a true causal model is actually something that also incorporates what we call counterfactuals. That is the Y. Was it that X that really caused the Y or what if I had acted differently? A question that you know, you'll find in Pearl's um, um, books and studies would be like, would Kennedy have been alive if, if Oswald had not shot him? One of the questions in my company that we worry about is, um, would these customers have still come back to us if we had not doled out coupons to them, say? Or would we have still acquired the same customers if we had not marketed through Facebook or Google, right? So that is where, if we can pinpoint what the true X is that is causing the Y, rather than just a predictive association, that's when we have efficiency gains. And my talk is going to focus on the methodologies that lead to um, building your models or thinking about building your AI models um, using, um, you know, incorporating for the fact that you also need to uh, count, uh, account for counterfactuals. Uh, some of the examples would be why do you need counterfactuals is something called Simpson's paradox. So what typically is a Simpson's paradox? Simpson's paradox is when you run an experiment and we all run experiments all the time. So when you run an experiment, um, say if a particular feature is going to give you more conversion and you run it on a set of customers, and you ran the same experiment to another set of customers, and in both experiments, you got a failure. But in effect, if you polluted the whole data and estimated the impact, it might give you a totally different result. And that typically happens a lot in the business space, as I observe. It's because of the fact that we do not account for counterfactuals. So going um, to how a true causal inference engine should look like, um, the approach is obviously there is knowledge, we need to make assumptions. That's again, something that's typically missing. You would see in you know, data-based modeling everywhere, what we typically call machine learning models are typically just data-based um, you know, algorithms set up there. And one of the key things that it misses is the assumptions, because sometimes we're trying to solve for something and something totally, totally counterintuitive comes up. And it, it really 
requires us to go back and think if truly we found the you know, right solutions. And so for a causal model, you need to have an assumption, you need to have a structural framework um, to think through it. Um, it needs to have testable implications, as we talked about. And then you would start querying the system, right? Can the query be answered? Um, if not, you would go back and redesign the model. If yes, you would have an estimate, which is, I'm not going to put a structure here right now, you know, all kinds of, there are a couple of kinds of, you know, uh, models that I'll talk about in the, um, big, uh, in the larger talk in the conference, um, like graphical models, back door, front doors, uh, natural experiments, and are the Bayesian methods um, that are available, uh, and instrumental variable estimation, which has proven to be very effective in deciphering causal models. Uh, why? But instrumental variable is a methodology which is typically used in econometrics to identify features when you really cannot observe the actual feature uh, by use of a proxy. And there are some people, some researchers have developed deep instruments as well, and they have been highly effective in, in utilizing the instrumental variable uh, methodology along with the deep learning or, or you know, combining that with the deep learning algorithm to actually understand causality way better. And so in, the, in my talk um, in another two or three weeks, in Seattle, I will be talking in detail about these methodologies and how can, you can improve your estimates better. You done? Yeah, focusing on machine learning and deep learning. And um, if you come to my talk, I will. Speak a little loud. I'm sorry. Speak a little louder. Sure, sure. If you if you come to my talk, I will tell you all about Rapids, which is um, uh, one of the latest software tools that we've released at NVIDIA. Um, and Rapids is motivated by the perpetual growth in, in data that we're observing in many different fields. Uh, you're probably familiar with this in your own domains. Um, so. When you typically look at you know the data science workflow, there's many different ways you can uh, slice it and dice it. In this particular diagram, uh, we're showing that data typically comes in from some form of a structured or unstructured data source into something that ultimately becomes structured, uh, is subsequently prepared for uh, ingestion by a model, model training occurs, and then interpretation and visualization happens uh, with subsequent deployment if all goes well and so uh, while this is you know all well and good uh, there's typically a lot of waiting that's happening uh, either in the model training phase or during the data preparation and visualization phase and so at NVIDIA one way that we have uh, hang on a second here Interesting. Okay, um, we have tried to solve this problem is by allowing our specialized hardware, which has many many cores, to be able to attack the data sets and the model training and algorithm building by leveraging all the inherent parallelism. And what we often see is that as a data scientist, in the past you may have had to you know, spend time working on a project and take long breaks uh, while waiting for a hypothesis to get tested as a model is training. Once you're able to leverage, um, you know, these accelerated tools, you can be very productive in that you can have an idea, quickly test it, understand how it can be improved, and continue progressing. And so that's kind of the core target of Rapids. And if you're familiar at all with uh, NVIDIA, we have optimized uh, the deep learning frameworks now uh, for some time. Uh, but this is now our foray into what you might consider to be classic machine learning, essentially everything that's not deep neural networks. And so the idea here is that, again, we're leveraging uh, CUDA, which is our accelerated library uh, under the hood. And that is talking to the graphical processing unit. Um, but on top of it, we've layered these different uh, high-level objects that you can use just like you typically use a, a Python library like Pandas or Scikit-Learn. And so the idea is that with minimal API change, a uh, developer gets to go really, really fast in doing the things that they're already interested in doing. 
Uh, some sample benchmarks here, uh, focusing on a data set that uh, was, I think this is the uh, Fannie Mae mortgage data set, and this spans around 17 years worth of mortgage data. And here uh, you can see a comparison between uh, essentially ETL on CPU nodes versus GPU nodes. The DGXs here are, uh, this is a 16 GPU system and this is five systems with eight GPUs each. Uh, and you can see that there's scaling that's occurring as you add more CPU nodes, uh, but it's vastly uh, outpaced once you start to leverage uh, th these GPU nodes. And again, one fundamental reason for why this is, is because modern CPUs oftentimes have between, let's say 20 cores or so, uh, whereas uh, a modern GPU will have higher than 5,000 cores typically. And so again, leveraging parallelism uh, in ETL is, is uh, very, very straightforward just because all of the rows can be independently processed. Uh, XGBoost is one of the popular uh, machine learning algorithms and I'll uh, sort of hone in on why in just a second. But uh, this is, uh, in this particular case, a regression and classification model training process. And you can see that adding more and more nodes to this doesn't necessarily improve performance. But again, the, the GPUs are uh, several orders of magnitude faster. And then again, end-to-end -end performance is, is very much reflecting of, of the speed up. So, um, you know, we've accelerated multiple algorithms now with Rapids. Uh, one of the ones that uh, is sort of near and dear to our hearts is known as XGBoost. And XGBoost is uh, described here, it's gradient tree boosting. Um, and pr the primary reason why we focus on this uh, algorithm, uh, we, we have many others now, but this was one of the earlier ones, is just because it performs so well with minimal tuning. And so if you encounter a data set and you don't really know what to do, one of the best things to try is just to uh, leverage gradient tree boosting or XG boost. Uh, and even with minimal hyperparameter optimization, you can oftentimes get the best performance. And this is just a sort of a fancy table showing pairwise comparisons between these different uh, popular modeling tools. Um, and, and this was a paper that compared essentially all of these uh, different machine learning methods on 165 data sets um, in the uh, bioinformatics literature. So, um, you know, essentially, let me show you a really quick example of what it looks like to use extra, uh, or sort of uh, rapids uh, versus typical uh, pandas or scikit-learn methods. So here we see principal components analysis, which is one of the sort of classic tools uh, in a data science toolbox for reducing dimensionality and visually exploring data. And on the left-hand side, you see the scikit-learn, which is a popular Python data science uh, API. Uh, and on the right-hand side, you see the uh, Rapids version. And you can see that the LabRH import has changed and uh, with relatively little other difference, uh, with the difference here being that we're having to transform this data frame into a CUDA data frame. But then the actual call to the algorithm looks almost identical, and in one case, you go much, much faster. If you increase the scale of, of the data set here, you can see um, orders of magnitude and differences. And that's kind of what we'll be doing too during my talk is I'll show you an interactive notebook. I'll show you just a little bit of it here in a second. This is just another version of, of a comparison side by side, this time for a clustering algorithm where we're looking at K nearest neighbors. And uh, again, a minimal code change, but vastly superior performance. And so um, for folks who are curious about uh, getting started with Rapids, there's many ways you can um, uh, bring this to your workstation. You can uh, go straight to the source. Uh, we have <clears throat> everything open source on GitHub at Rapids AI. You could also uh, bring in a container from Docker Hub or from our uh, NVIDIA uh, Google, uh, GPU cloud repository where we have pre-built containers with the entire software stack. Or you can use uh, Condo or PIP, which are you know very popular in the data science community as well. Um, let me just really quickly show you guys um, the Rapids website. So um, when you first come to uh, Rapids, uh, and sorry, the, this is just rapids.ai, you see this website and you can go on here and you can read all about uh, the features and, and how everything is working and all the contributors. Um, if you step into the get started, it'll show you, uh, you know, how simple it is to actually leverage this code uh, in your own 
uh, examples. And then there's many different ways that you can actually pull this down and get it productive. You can use Conda, you can pick your operating system, your Python version, and, and the, the particular driver set that you have for CUDA. And then this command will pop up, which you can then leverage to build this uh, from source. Or you can start with a pre-built container, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And so, um, you know, for those who are already familiar with data frames, this is this should be a one-to-one -one mapping. So this is just a cheat sheet that you can again see from our website. The idea here being that these are essentially mirror matches of uh, things like the Pandas API, uh, where you're just constructing data frames from records or from uh, direct uh, declarations, and then you can, you know, do things like you know uh, perform filters or find the largest values. Um, you can uh, also uh, summarize data, perform statistical operators like min, max, absolute value, et cetera, et cetera. And you can start doing also slightly more complex operators like merging multiple data frames together. And so this is um, a good way to get started. And you can see some of these features are planned for future release. Uh, we're actively working on this. I think we're up to release uh, 0.6 and 0.7 is on the way. And uh, everything is up on GitHub. so. Um, if you hop on GitHub, for example, you can see uh, all of the underlying libraries that make this possible. Uh, so you can also you know, jump into something like uh, QDF and look at the issues or file your own issue. And our engineers are hardly you know, uh, at work on satisfying these feature requests and any of the bugs that come up. Um, I'll only, only point out one other thing, which is that uh, in the QML, which is the machine learning subset, we keep an active set of supported algorithms as well as the algorithms in progress. So if you're looking for a particular type of algorithm, um, check here first. And so let me just give you a very brief taste of what the actual interactive portion will be. And for folks who attend the session, you'll be able to pull this down um, and you can uh, try playing with it. I encourage you to have Rapids pre-built before you join. But essentially what we'll do is we'll pull down some data uh, and actually we'll synthetically generate it here on the fly. Um, and then uh, we'll be able to visualize that data. And so we'll be working with data sets that look like this. So this first one is the moon's data set. Uh, the next one is this blobs data set. And this last one here is the Swiss roll data set. And essentially what we'll do is we'll concatenate them together into one common um, uh, uh, data set here and use a classifier to figure out based on a coordinate whether it needs to belong to the blobs, Swiss roll, or half moons. And in this particular image you see in purple the training data and then yellow is the test data. Uh, and while we do this we'll have uh, sort of a side-by-side -side comparison of um, oops, um, uh, of the GPU utilization and the CPU utilization as well as we do various operators. So for example, if we wanted to compare the speed of the data load uh, on CPU, uh, we could see that this took about 3.4 seconds to load uh, on the CPU, whereas on the GPU it took about 385 milliseconds to load. And we'll sort of continue working on the ETL portion uh, and ultimately model training uh, as well as model inference.